Two for One Draft. Austin Gale here with Mike Renner on the lovely Friday edition of two for one drafts really excited for what we have for you guys today we're going to start with a defensive tackle overview a class overview we got we're going over like what 20 guys going to talk about 20 different defensive tackles every single one of them in our top 50 and even guys outside of our top 50 that is in currently in the 2020 nfl draft guide made available to all pff edge and elite subscribers support the two for one drafts podcast go buy a pff sub and after the defensive tackle class overview if you're not watching on youtube if you are listening to the audio version which I encourage everyone to do you'll get the Denzel Mims interview the wide receiver from Baylor who was fantastic by the way absolutely fantastic a very bright kid so smart I, I really did like Denzel Mims coming out of that interview and Hunter Bryant as well the Washington tight end who was another great interview as well you'll get both of those but let's go ahead and dive into this defensive tackle group huh Renner? A little nicer things you had to say there about Mims and Bryant. Well, no, I, Mims just, I, I mean, some, you, you come out of some of these interviews <laughs> and you're just kind of like blown away by how much this guy understands the game, how much mm-hmm. he understands his position. He He's, said he said it wasn't his athleticism, it wasn't his contested catchability, all these things. He said like one of the major takeaways is that he just knows the game. He knows what every single person on each play is going to do. And it's like that, he's like he takes like a quarterback's approach to every play in terms of having a game plan, knowing what others are doing, blocking appropriately, all these things. I think. That's just smart players are good in the NFL. He's been a rocket ship <laughs> in the pre-draft process. Sam Monson, wide receiver three for him. Oh, my gosh. Drop the take. I don't know Twitter. if I'm ready for that. I don't know <laughs> if I'm ready for that. But, I mean, I, all, all, every single part of this process, the senior bowl, the combine, the mm-hmm. interview process have been, gr- you know, green line just trending up for Denzel Mims. So, I mean, yeah. I could not be – I would not be surprised if he got, he got drafted very high. Yeah, that's another example of the, you know, no matter how high you are in a guy, someone else is just going to be having the take that's We, like we had that Denzel take with Mims, Connor, Connor Rogers at the combine. Yeah. I mean, if you did, haven't listened to that podcast, go back and listen to it. We're like, there's always a guy that loves a prospect more, more than, than you. you. It's just you every You will never time. love a guy as much as someone who has a number one on the board <laughs> out there. Some All right, let's get, let's get to this defensive tackle group, starting with – number one which i kind of want to spend some time with because recently especially talking to the analytics crew dr eric eager and george Chahuri did not have auburn defensive tackle in the first round of their mock draft mm-hmm. they do not see him as a first round caliber player from a value standpoint because he won't offer that significant value as a pass rusher and impact the passing game he right now he is 12th on pff's latest big board that's largely done by you with some input from others but Derek brown at 12 where are you right now on this kind of debate of of him being a top 10 player him being a first rounder what is your like kind of you know bottom line with Derek brown all right i go back and forth on this and i kind of had this take this year that i I had in years past been like i care about pass rush with these guys you know defensive tackles you still have you have to be able to rush the passer that's what's most valuable in the nfl the passing game blah 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 whatnot I've kind of changed my tune in recent years in terms of I think that guys who are elite in run defense and can offer something as a pass rusher, you don't have to be elite in that regard, but just like pocket pushing ability to where they can be on the field every down, I'm, I will draft a guy like that in the first round because of what it does to you schematically in terms of not having your linebackers be as worried about the run game. And, and when you have linebackers, when you have undersized defensive tackles and your linebackers are worried about getting kept clean, about having to defend the run game, then they're worse in coverage. And that sort of trade-off of these undersized DTs that are liabilities kind of in the run game uh, then screw your linebackers in coverage. Mm-hmm. And so it's kind of a twofold. It's kind of like yeah. an unintended consequence of having that. If you have a guy who's super stout in run defense, two DTs that are super stout in run defense, and you know you have these, you know, I go back to these like undersized, you have the Jaguars linebackers, the undersized guys who need to be kept clean uh, or else they're you know, not going to be able to make plays in the run game. And then you see a play action fake, you're not coming straight downhill as a linebacker if you know that uh, you don't have to. Like, mm-hmm. you don't have to to still be able to make a play. You can not bite on that fake and then drop into coverage, and that sort of – that helps you out more than that added increase in pass rush because there's not a lot of, you know, quote-unquote needle movers in pass rush at the NFL level at defensive tackle. There were eight guys last year who had pass rushing grades over 80. Oh, wow. At the entire position. So there's just not a lot to go around. That means there's not going to be one every single draft. Mm-hmm. There's not going to be that guy – uh, in this draft, if there was, you know, if I had to put him in, I want to probably be the next guy we're going to talk about, Javon Kinlaw, who could be that difference maker. I don't think Derek Brown's going to be that necessarily difference maker, but I bet he grades in like the 70s as a pass rusher. I bet he's like going to be a solid, you know, pocket pusher. And at that point, I think you're still, with how elite he projects to as a run defender, I think you're still recruiting a lot of value. And the war even said, the war even trends towards at the defense acquisition, the guys who are better run defenders and making more plays in the run game because. 
as long as teams are still running the football, stopping the run still has value. Yeah, I, I think to kind of pull that, I think anecdotally you're saying if you're undersized and or poor run defenders up front, yes. and you're also undersized at off-ball linebacker, it's going to have a negative effect on your run defense. You need to have some beef in the middle or yes. some elite run and, defense and it's, up front. And it's going to have a negative effect on your pa- on your pass coverage game. Because your coverage. linebackers have to play more downhill to account for yes. you know, the undersized the up top. And I think I think anecdotally that makes sense. I think the logic makes sense. I'd be interested to see if there is data studies that could be done to kind of prove that theory and, and look at like look at things like yeah. when you have know. when you have poor run defenders up top or guys that can only one gap up top yeah how does that affect your coverage how does that affect your run defense from your off-ball linebackers and Mm -hmm. then do it do it differently with guys who have really big beef up front i think it's (laughs) i think it's sound sound logic really big beef gotta go to the showers to find that one out but yeah (laughs) no uh, i will talk to eric and uh george i've actually no but and and that that last comment i think shouldn't go understated war i've seen guys like no not the showers (laughs) comment i've seen guys like lawrence guy and, and um uh, other like kind of run first interior defensive linemen rank high in PFF WAR because yeah. yes. they offer value on what? you know some t- in some games sixty percent of plays. Like I mean they offer value and sometimes over half the game. And, and then think- and then the other point that like when you are coming from behind as a defense when you're down. Are we in the third- showers again? Or- <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ! As, when you're in the third third fourth quarter and you're behind, what do you want? Do you want a pass rushing DT or do you want a run stuffing DT? Mm-hmm. You want the run stuff because yes, yes, yeah, they're yeah. going to run. They're going to be yeah. running the football to come back. You want that. So that, that is a. Uh, it's a, it's another intricate problem that uh, I'm not sure there's a great answer to, but we're gonna we're trying. To no, but I think to kind of sum it up, it. anecdotally, I really agree with what you said in terms of if you're both if you're undersized up front and force more pressure on your already yes. undersized off ball linebackers because every team is trying to get more lighter yes, at off ball linebackers. Have, you can't, be, you, can't yeah. you can't have the beef at linebacker because mm-hmm. those guys are going to struggle exactly. in coverage more so. But does having similar lack of size up front negatively affect all phases of the off ball linebackers play? I think it's interesting, so, an interesting conversation. Also stemmed from is Derek Brown this top 10 top first round pick right now where are you comfortable taking Derek Brown let's get back to Derek Brown then so probably not top 10 and especially in this class uh probably not around top 15 either just because I think it's a good uh, there's a lot of talent at a lot of valuable positions tackle wide receiver cornerback in this draft class that I think if you're you know trying to win today's NFL those positions are just always going to be more valuable you got to lock down those positions so I'd see uh probably in the 15 to 20 range, I, I could feel comfortable with Derek Brown. Yeah, and, and I, I, like if you took him, I probably wouldn't argue with him because at the end of the day, I think he'll finish in the top 32 of this draft class in terms of wins above replacement added over the course of you know his rookie contract. Because bang. I think he'll be good in run defense out the gate. Like he has, he's the strongest DT in this class, has the length, has the you know all the skills you want. Man, at that point. That, so. I, I think I'm with you there. I think I'm with you that yeah. that that 15 to 20 range. I start to feel really good about it because I do think, and I saw someone tweet this. I don't even know if it was you or not, but. Mm-hmm. I would not want to be the team inside the top 15 that comes away from this class with all this receiver talent, all this offensive tackle ca- talent with the defensive tackle like Derek Brown. That's just, I just wouldn't. Yes. I would rather have one of the receivers. I'd rather have yeah. one of these offensive tackles or the quarterback. Yeah, but then there comes a point at you know all of those positions, all those sort of, you know value positions where you're chasing an upside that's so unlikely to hit. Yes, no, absolutely. Like, you're, yeah, like you, you still, it behooves you to have good players yeah. in a lot of different positions. But there are four roster. off of the tackles you would want to take in the top 15. Yes. There are probably three, maybe four receivers teams are willing to take in the top 15. Maybe. Yeah. You know, you, I, I think with that being said, you start to stack this up, the two quarterbacks go, maybe three quarterbacks go, all of a sudden Javon Kinlaw maybe does slide, I'm not sure. All right, let's keep moving forward here. We spent a lot of time on Derek Brown and we spent a lot of time really on just defensive tackle and trying to evaluate him. I think I think it's an interesting conversation. Javon Kinlaw is next. He's 13th yes. on PFS Big Board. He's the South Carolina defensive tackle. Tall, long, great character, former Juco prospect that's still very raw, admittedly raw, but productive. And when you are raw and productive, I, I, I feel like I get more excited about guys that are raw and unproductive, largely because if you can do it when you don't have a ton of tools, think about when this guy learns two or three more moves at the next level. Yeah, and that's the thing. I might, when it's all said and done, have Kinlaw above Brown. Hello. Even after that whole whole rant thing, because he could be like a Chris Jones type. Like he has that athleticism, he has that length, he has the you know the skill sets that are necessary to rush the passer at a high level at the NFL level, to be an actual difference maker at that position. Uh, I mean, thirty-four plus inch arms, three fifteen, three hundred fifteen pounds. Actually, can't count. I was three twenty-four, which like I. Had, I don't know why he's getting bigger. I'd probably slim down if I were this dude. Uh, rush the pass a little bit more at the next level. But, I mean, just at, like I said, I've said it before. Uh, this is how you'd build a defensive tackle if you were trying to, to rush the passer at the NFL level. 
uh, strength, quickness, all that sort of stuff. But again, he has like a push pull move and kind of a bull rush. And sometimes he'll play high and he'll play high against the run. He's not nearly the run defender Derek Brown is. But can that if, not if be coached? Him, though? Yeah, like playing high, that's what I'm saying. Like playing coached. high is just a consistency sort of like you see him play low at times and, and it's good. But then he'll just, you know, get a little lazy and pop up out of his stance and you and just will not be nearly as effective in his pass rushing moves either. So from the interviews I've heard as well, I do think he has the demeanor, character and wit to improve with coaching drastically yeah. like improve pad level improve yeah. his pass rush moves repertoire whatever it may be and i think for that reason i get more and more more and more on board with guys who have all these tools and and raw you know type of yeah and only two years of even like major college coaching yep like he, he was at a juco for two years prior so yep and he was one of the highest graded defensive tackles this past year correct I, if we go to the grading yeah so he had the highest grade of any defensive tackle pass rushing grade of a defensive tackle in 2018 of any returning defensive tackle and then had the second highest this past year behind the man who's next on our list, actually, Jordan he, Elliott. Yeah, just diving on, just tying a bow here on Javon Kinlaw. 2017, a 74.1 overall grade on 378 defensive snaps, improved to an 85.0 overall grade in 2018 on over 500 snaps. And then this past year, 89.3 overall grade on 625 defensive snaps. Improving your grade every year of your career good. is always good. We do like seeing that in the grading profile. Moving forward here, Jordan Elliott. The Missouri defensive tackle that I've seen go all the way down to day three on some people's boards, but uh, we have had him as a first-rounder for quite some time, and I feel really good about it. He was the highest-graded defensive tackle in all of college football last year. He's the 20th-ranked uh, player on PFS Big Board, defensive tackle number three. An impressive player, a guy that will need to one-gap at the next level, more so than like a Derrick Brown can two-gap and things like that. But Jordan Elliott can rush up field. He can push the pocket. He can be a good pass rusher in the NFL. Yeah, he's probably a three-tech. He's yep. probably not going to be super versatile along the defensive you know, line interior. Uh, I, I don't know. I, I think he can uh, develop into – because we've seen him take improve by leaps and bounds for over early in his career at Missouri. Uh, was a Texas transfer – uh, started his career at Texas, then transferred to Missouri uh, as a redshirt sophomore. Wasn't even really a starter. He was a kind of a rotational player until towards the end of that season. Had a dominant game against Arkansas, a dominant game against Tennessee. Had into this year, we're like, man, if he continues like what we saw then this year, could be something special. And he did. I mean, he led the all defense tackles in the country in grading. Uh, I think he's pretty po has some pretty powerful hands. Like you see him rock dudes on contact. Uh, when he gets, you know, engaged and then can throw him, can shed, make plays as well. And again, like you said, one gap, he can get upfield off the last scrimmage, a 5.02 40 yard dash uh, is pretty darn good for a 300 plus pounder uh, most years, except for like the handful of guys that ran like sub four, eight this year, kind of put them to shame. The but Davises. Yeah. <laughs> we'll get to uh, those guys later. But yeah, Elliot, I, I think he just offers a lot. Like he's not going to, with Brown and Kinlaw, you're kind of chasing it's my point of like you're chasing like freakish traits like Brown's just so strong. Kinlaw is just so, you know, how you'd build a defense tackle. Elliott's not that, but he still has good traits for the position. And at that point, I think he's closer to those guys than a lot of people would like to admit. An 86.6 .6 overall grade in 2018 and a 92.4 college football high, 92.4 overall grade in 2019. Impressive stuff for Jordan Elliott. Let's jump to 31, who is kind of the an edge, was an edge defender primarily at Auburn, but best projects after gaining a ton of weight in the pre-draft process yeah. as a defensive tackle at the next level, and a damn good one at that. He's the 31st-ranked player on PFF's board, defensive tackle or interior defender number four, Marlon Davis. Davidson of Auburn I really do like because I think you say it best here is that he had he had okay athleticism for edge defender mm -hmm. but he's got good if not great athleticism for a defensive tackle and I think he can get on the outside shoulder of guards he can get upfield and kind of push the pocket very well and I also think th these guys coming out of Auburn know how to play the run I, I mean they're well coached in that regard I think Marlon Davidson yeah, is I mean a that's plus why he's run that's why he's playing edge. Yeah, exactly. They want yeah. to stuff. Yeah, the run. it's like similar. So I think Auburn and Georgia similarly kind of put some some beef to get back to that word on on the edges there to kind of like help play the run and all those things. I think Marlon Davidson though, as a defensive tackle, has more upside than he does if Ooh. he's going to be an edge defender. Upside in quotes. Yes. No. I I agree. so I agree that he is better suited interior. Yes. And like he and obviously admitted it to himself because he gained a bunch of weight to go do it. <laughs> you know. So he thought so himself. Now. Daniel Jeremiah thought he's still an edge defender. Thought he was would work best on the edge. In the really, NFL. I think he's pure three technique in terms of his moves, how he worked the edge, 
uh, was not again. And again, it was because when he was on the edge, he wasn't winning the edge. Yep. And if you don't win the edge consistently, uh, especially in the NFL, like not a lot of tackles give you that inside move. Not a lot of tackles are going to lose via the bull rush, you know, consistently. So you're just going to limit yourself. But on the interior, he's more than quick enough to get to the edge. Like he has uh, the bend to do so. And we saw him at the Senior Bowl in the limited time he was there. He kind of he was dominant. Had some really dominant reps uh, in that week of practices so he's only like there a day and a half though but davidson i don't know i, I it's difficult anytime you're projecting guy to do something you really haven't seen him do a lot yeah. of and we didn't see him do a lot of that at auburn but he the the sort of uh silver lining or the thing that we feel comfortable about is even out of position he's still graded really well like he's still graded better than a lot of you know edges in this class who are getting rumored for you know day two sort of picks. So uh, I, I like Mar Marlon Davidson. If you're taking him back into the first round, uh, you know you need a three technique, need some pass rusher there. Uh, I think he can do it. And I think he play run. Like, I think he can hold up and run defense as well. And he also had one of the better quotes of the entire combine. I'm going to read it to you. What I love most about the game is that I can literally go out there and hit a man consistently and pound him, and the police won't come. That has that has traditional GMs really, you know, chopping at the bit to get their hands on Marlon Davidson. I think yeah, I didn't see hopefully that. He doesn't have any like legal issues in the future. That that that, that one could like that, that, one's that get tweet will up, get like, that yeah. tweet will get some retweets. Exactly. I get that, but I, I I agree with a lot what you said with Marlon Davidson. Let's jump to Justin Matabuke, the Texas A&M defensive tackle 45th ranked player on pfs board yeah let's let's throw him and blacklock kind of together so ross blacklock the tcu defense tackle is next on this board both guys defensive tackle five and defensive tackle six on both PFS guys board. athletically probably the two most athletic defense tackles in the class in terms of all around all encompassing like what they can do but both are sub 300 pounds so these are the guys that kind of fit the mold of like guys i would would have loved in years past me like these they have all the pass rushing tools they can do that but run defense is the worry with both of them you're, you're almost going to have to schematically protect in terms of what they do at the next level in terms of run defense if you are uh if you're a one gapping team you know if you're a team that likes to get upfield you're going to like these guys like they can penetrate both of them have shown that consistently on their tape uh, Matt Abuke, I think, is a more refined pass rusher at this point. That's why he gets the kind of the nod. And he actually went to the combine and tested out a little better than Ross Blacklock did, which was surprising to me because I thought just on tape, Blacklock's sort of agility in that w was going to be was going to test out elite. Didn't necessarily look that way at the combine, but I, I think both. I mean, both tested out still pretty uh, well in that regard. So I'm not like worried about either. But Matt Abuke did test out a little better in my eyes. Uh, has a little more pass rushing moves. Uh, has shown, you know, he took over that Ole Miss game, really just like was head up on the center a lot of snaps, and just when he had a two-way go, it was over. You know, he gets a guy with two-way go, he's just too quick for college offensive linemen. But he's also jacked. Yeah. Matabuke is jacked, like very much so. I think he's got, he's got like good weight on him, even though he does come in at, you know, 293 pounds. This guy's pretty pretty stacked up. Six foot three, 293 pounds, clocked a 483, 40-yard dash. 31 reps on the bench press, too, mm -hmm. with 33 and a half inch arms and a 7373 cone. He did not do any of the other drills at the combine. But Matabuke, you, you see that athleticism on tape. You see that pop. I, I think there's there, – he wasn't on the Jordan Elliott level of production, though, from a grading standpoint. That's the he, thing. He didn't get all the way up there. But I, I kept on hearing Bucky Brooks say this when he's scouting. And I think this is I, – I kind of found this interesting. When you have a question mark about – a player and his production specifically you need to find out why especially when they have these tools to be better like a caleb on chase on for example or julian aquara why were you inconsistent why did you not produce if you are this good i think finding that out whether it be something behind the scenes or like technique standpoint is super important because if it's technique maybe it can be coached out if it's off field maybe his situation can change because i think mm -hmm. finding out what exactly needs to change for you to be a 90 plus type of player in your grading system is interesting and i think i, I think with his why i don't know what it is why he's not performing at the level he probably should be with the athleticism and skills that he has but i do think he has those tools that teams are going to like yeah because he i mean goes against georgia one pressure disappears in that game disappears against alabama only two pressures 56.3 pass rushing grade like better offensive lines took him to task yeah which is concerning 
I mean, he did have his grade improve every year of his career, 74.8 to 84.2 to 85.7 across 567 defensive snaps in 2019, a top 20 defensive tackle from a grading perspective, but you still ask for a little bit more, a little bit more pass rush production if you are going to be this athlete in this, especially yeah. at 293 pounds. Like you, you need to be rushing the passer at a high level if you're going to kind of have a ton of value at the next mm-hmm. level. Both these guys are flyer second rounders to me at that point then with mm-hmm. that sort of athleticism. Daniel Jeremiah has Ross Blacklock. Let's talk, jump to him a little bit. He has Ross Blacklock, I think, in the top 20 yeah. of his board. I mean, he's an athletic freak. I, we talked about him. If you haven't listened to the Daniel Jeremiah podcast, by the way, it's the one, the Wednesday edition, the episode before this, go back and listen to that one because it was fantastic. Daniel was Jeremiah was was great. Um, but with Black Blocks, uh, Black Block, Black Lock, 6'4", 300-pounder, uh, 81.5 overall grade across 570 defensive snaps this past year. Love his get-off. I, I think he get off, he gets out of the, uh, the break there quick, but I, I, I do think he's very raw. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and that's the thing. He just doesn't have pass rushing moves like he has pretty much like zero like he is just uh, a bull in a china shop when he's going after the qb there's really no rhyme or reason to what he's throwing out which they don't really teach it like we've heard like tcu is not a pass rushing development sort of academy the way ohio state is the way clemson is like they're not getting the best coaching there so that it's almost encouraging like if, if he was coming out of this like ohio state you'd be way we'd be way lower on this guy because we'd be like why that why the hell isn't you know why doesn't he look like any of the other Ohio State guys? But because he's because he is raw, because he is coming from a program like TCU, you can almost forgive that and see. I do. <laughs> you all right? Yeah, I'm fine. You can almost forgive that and see, uh, you know, what uh, that his best football is ahead of him. Sorry. Gotcha. All right, let's jump to Neville Gallimore, the Oklahoma defensive tackle, hometown Ottawa, Canada. By the way, six foot two, three hundred four pounder. Came in. A lot of people expected good things from him. And he did test well from a 40-yard dash standpoint, a 479 40-yard dash. I also don't hate the 23 reps on the bench. But where he struggled, oh, man, did he struggle, was change of direction drills. Three cone, a 797, 20-yard shuttle, 501. And I think people said this right after it happened. I think that does kind of match with his tape. He's very explosive but somewhat out of control when asked to change direction in the backfield. And I don't know. I, I think that's a big reason why he's not a top five defensive tackle on PFS board. I think explosive, yes, but in terms of having those those finishing that finishing mm-hmm. skill set with change of direction, bend, all those things, he does. I don't know if that's there. Yeah, I worry about Gallimore. The combine was really worrisome because those are bad numbers. Two, he's twenty three years old already. Like he's oh, old. You're not, and he and he looks he looks raw for twenty three years old in terms of like he's the kind of guy who the moves look like he's reading them out of a manual and then putting them into action as a pass rusher like they're not natural like he's not reacting the way you you want a guy to react to an offensive lineman's punch he's not immediately you know swatting it away he's kind of just like i do the move that i do i do my Man. i do my rip move and then i go uh it's that just damning and, and it's not that's not good and now he's looked better a lot this year from what he looked like last year and his grade improved from 75.0 as a pass rusher in 18 to 82.4 this past year but with all that get off with as you know sub 484 like he is explosive in a straight line he should have been just murderous you know against college offensive line you know being older than all these other college offensive line is facing he should have been in the backfield every single play you would think with that athleticism he wasn't and then he doesn't have you know the change direction ability like he doesn't have uh that sort of bend necessary to get back to the quarterback and to you know when you're on the edge of an offensive tackle not just get completely washed past the pocket but to actually get uh, you know, into uh, the meat of the pocket. Uh, Hello. <laughs> with your beard. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus Christ. <laughs> All right, but, keep it rolling. But I just, so I, well, that's why we're lower. And, and I do, I might even, he might even go lower even after that because I just, I don't think that's a skill set that's ever going to change. I don't, I don't yep. see that. I don't see the upside that maybe others do with him. I love how you put upside in quotes there. All right, let's jump to the next two guys. Let's move quickly. we got a lot of names to yeah, cover. Do. Devon Hamilton, the Ohio State defensive tackle, and Raekwon Davis of Alabama. Yes. No, yes, Alabama. Raekwon Davis of Alabama there at 102 and 104, respectively, on PFF's board. I liked, I think Devon Hamilton has some room to get up more, though. I, I mean, he had a good combine. I think his senior bowl was a little bit underrated. He is kind of tagged as, like, the opposite of what Matt Abuke and Rouse Blacklock are, and he's like kind of this bigger, bigger, beefier guy. But he tested well. I, I really did he's, like his testing. Yeah, he's one of the best pure nose tackles in this draft class. Like, you saw him at the Senior Bowl. Just guys could not hold up. The Nick Harris-Devon Hamilton matchup at the Senior Bowl was, like, unfair. <laughs> Nick Harris, like, you saw him trying to anchor and just, like, waves, like, crashing over Nick Harris. Wow. Just, like, 
backwards. I kind of feel it. Backwards. I can he, smell he just, the ocean. <laughs> <laughs> he just kept like Devon Hamilton has that sort of uh, just so much strength throughout his frame that I think he's going strength to be... and mass. Like when you have strength yeah. and mass, which is somewhat becoming rare at the defense tackle mm-hmm. position because nose tackles aren't a starting player on a lot of defenses anymore. When you have strength and mass and you're going against some of these undersized centers, the Garrett Bradbury, Nick Harris's of the world, yeah. like you can you can crash some waves. Yeah, he did 33 bench reps at the combine, 5.14 40, which was a better was vertical better than, than Juwan Jennings, better than Derek Brown's there. <laughs> so like he has that in him, kind of a guy who just like he'll control your center all game long. That that's his. That's his MO. That's what he brings to the table. I'm not sure he's ever going to play a ton of snaps is the worry at this point because he's never played more than 357 snaps in a single season. Oh, career. man. That's the Ohio State defensive line. They rotate, and he's never done that, never had more than 20 pressures in the right season. Right there is a career. huge benefit of the draft guide because yeah. you can see his production. You can see these things. You think Devon Hamilton, you know, a starting caliber player at Ohio State, whether or not he was, he never played more than 360 defensive snaps. And I don't know if that was due to injury. No, no, no. He's, that's this just guy's Ohio just, State's defense line. They they, they – Rotate, rotate guys in. Rotate, Man, rotate. That's every game this past that, year. That, that is very interesting. So, right, with Devon Hamilton, let's jump to Raekwon Davis. And Raekwon Davis is the guy who we just said never developed as a pass rusher. And if you're drafting him thinking you're going to get a pass rusher, you just I don't think it's going to happen at this point. The His overall grade has decreased each year over the past three years. <laughs> an 84.9 overall grade in 2017 and just an 81.1 overall grade in 2019. Dude's a monster, built like a monster, Frankenstein type of guy, but yeah. I don't see him being – he's like a – you know, in, in terms of like what you're projecting production, like poor man's Derek Brown. In terms of like he's not even going to pass yeah. rush in the 60s, in the high 70s or anything along those lines. It's going to be 60s, but maybe he finds a way to get to an 80 plus run defense type of grade. Yeah, so he's six six, almost 34 inch arms, 11 inch hands. Like he feels. Oh man, he he feels like. 20 years ago, he would have been covered a lot high, more highly because, you know, everyone wanted that 3-4 defensive end. That's his build to a T, but he is not, you know, two-gapping. You can two-gap your offensive tackle all day long, but he is not going to rush the passer. And he's just not going to get any pass rush out of him. And, and I don't think he's versatile enough to where you can kick him in. Like, he has to either play over the tackle or over the guard. He can't go inside. You can't put him at nose tackle. And at that point... A non-versatile run defender is just like you're going to be low. But he played for Alabama, and (laughs) he's big. I I I still think he should have come out like honestly last year because he would have been a higher draftee than he is. Yeah, wow, that's that's crazy. Do you think he goes on day two or is he a day three player? I'm saying how you how you view the NFL, how the NFL views him. I mean, Lance Zerline had a super high grade on him. Really? Yeah, like over a seven, which is starter somewhere early. Oh wow! So I think he still goes maybe third round. Man, that is that is incredible. All right, let's jump forward here. James Lynch, m- former Baylor edge defender, be- probably better projects as an interior defensive lineman at the next level. Very productive as well. Yeah. This guy had some pressure, a bit high pressure count, if I remember correctly. Mm-hmm. He, he actually high pressure count. I mean, he led the nation in pressure. There we but go. He that's also that's led, what it was. He also led the nation. He had a, almost 500 pass rushing snaps uh, this past year. The interesting thing with him, so 295 pounds. Rush pretty much so they would they had three down linemen in Baylor's front. He would be, you know, either like a five technique, he'd be outside the tackle, or literally, you know, even wider on the majority of his snaps. But he, he had a much higher pass rushing grade off the edge than he did on the interior. So that's kind of it's a, it's kind of concerning in terms of he has to play in the interior at the next level. Two hundred ninety five pounders are not going to be edge defenders in the NFL anymore, just because. I mean, you run into a quarterback who runs the option, you're screwed like, yeah. with that guy. Like, you can't have him check, tracking down Lamar Jackson in space. It's not ever going to happen. So you just have to be a little more athletic than he is on the edge. Uh, but the fact that he really, on the interior, when he was rushing the passer, it was night and day in terms of his grading. And if you want to find out the exact grade, you can go find it in the draft guide. Uh, another interesting nugget there that you'll find. But he, so he rushes better on the edge than he does in the interior, but has has to play in the interior in the NFL. So I don't, I'm not exactly sure what to make of him, but he has athleticism. Uh, has the little short T-Rex arms, unfortunately, but uh, there's lots to like. like. He uses his hands really well, despite them not being that far away from his body. <laughs> <laughs> All right, let's love the other Baylor kid in there, too. I, I know you like this. Bra- Roy. Has you're, you're a big fan of Bravion Roy. Arms. This was like the T-Rex D-line uh, in all of college football. Bravion Roy, I think, had 30-inch arms. Uh, didn't get a combine invite, unfortunately, but he oh. got an invite to uh, the Shrine game, and he lit up the one-on-ones of the Shrine game. If you want to go watch, it's actually awesome. Uh, he, with those little tiny arms, just can – get into dudes and just once he gets on the edge of people like he has like a little rip with those arms uh, i love and, how and you're just, just tucking <laughs> it in yeah 
he probably has like, it's like same, all wrists. Probably has the same length <laughs> arms as I do. And I'm just, but uh, no, he's a real nice rip move. But he kind of plays high for a nose tackle, which is a bad combination when projecting to the NFL. A high nose tackle. So I, I love him as pass rusher in the nose tackle position. Though he might be my favorite of all the pure nose tackles in terms of his pass even above Devon ability. Hamilton. Yes. Oh, man. I mean, this guy, he has some moves. He throws in that fat boy swim move. Any guy that throws in a fat boy swim move, I'm immediately like. I can get bored with a fat boy swim, but, I mean, if you've got a doggy paddle arm, (laughs) I don't know how that swim's going to play in the NFL. All right, moving forward here, last two guys in the top 50. Then we're going to dive into some guys that are are listed in the draft guy but have not cracked PFF's top 50. You keep saying top 50. Top 150. I'm stupid. Top 150. I think you said it like five times today. I agree. And I I corrected you yesterday. You're like, I said top 50? What? Yeah, (laughs) I suck. I suck. So in the top 150, these last two guys, Lucky Foto of Utah at 126 and McTelvin Aguim at 128. So those are the last two defensive tackles in PFF's top 150. We're going to dive into some names in the draft guide outside of that, but let's start with Foto. Um, Big dude. Didn't get a chance to play at the Senior Bowl. I would have really, really liked to see him at the Senior Bowl because at Utah, he was not asked a ton to kind of pin his ears back and blow up some offensive tackles against the pass. He was playing the run, and he played it very well, but I want to see, can you move this mountain of a man into a premier pass rusher? Because, I I mean, he does have a lot of the tools that you like. That's the thing. He has kind of some, like, freakish traits to him. The USC game is absurd. Like, he, he, like, eats people alive in that game. And I think if you saw more opportunities like he had in US against USC – You'd be talking about Lucky Futu, Fotu a, a bit higher right now. Massive dude, 6'5", 330, 34 and a quarter inch arms, 10 to 5 eighths inch hands. Just everything about him is huge. And then he had a 5.15 40 yard dash, which like at that size is very, very good number. Mike dropped that, didn't he? No, no, and no then other 21, drills. 21 bench reps, so no other drills after that. Those two, but at, at Utah, a lot of what they asked him to do was kind of like grab guard center, uh, you know, right at the snap, get up and then like run read that sort of thing. He wasn't allowed to get into backfields and to press off the line of scrimmage. And you kind of saw actually more than 18, and he had a better pass rushing grade in 2018 than he did in 2019. I think he offers something in terms of just like, if you give him just a little more uh, ability to fire off into offensive linemen quicker than he got at Utah and not just standing up, because I actually didn't like him when he was like running. He got moved off the line of scrimmage far too easily. But oh, really? he has explosiveness to him. He has like all the traits you want to play the run at the NFL level it's just like it wasn't consistently there at Utah for the defensive tackle position too so. assignment can change drastically exactly. like, right. and like a changing assignment legit like what you're asked to do on each play I'm not ne- not even necessarily talking about scheme like where you play I'm talking mm-hmm. about legitimately what they want you to do on first second and third down you can change drastically bad at the other so. exactly and I, I I think with Utah maybe misassigned not misaligned huh you like that you like that <laughs> and that's right. why they lost against Oregon like <laughs> they got they got their ass kicked in the run game all right 120 uh, you, you said before the pie, he's like, dude, I'm, I'm an Agim fan. You like this guy. This dude, so I said. Is it Agim? Agim? I'll look into it. You go. Ajim, but, oh, Ajim. Oh, wow. Uh, McTelvin. Okay. Awesome first name, by the way. Uh, it's like Telvin, but then like if McDonald's had a Telvin. Um, but McTelvin, Ajim. Um, <laughs> that was awful. <laughs> All right, keep uh, going. Here. Myself. McTelvin, Ajim, he dominated the trying game even more so than uh, Brave on Roy, who I just talked about. Absolutely the highest graded guy, defensive tackle there in the one on ones. 179% of his reps there. Uh, a lot of them from nose tackle. He's probably more of a, he's more of a versatile guy at the NFL level uh, in terms of he's not just a nose tackle. He's probably more a guy who could play any defensive tackle alignment. But he tested out really well at the combine also. He's a former a, five star. Yeah, had a good grade at Utah this past season, 81.5 pass rushing grade. Um, that, there's a lot to work with here. Uh, um, I don't know why. Like he ha- and he has a lot of. He's an interesting guy because he already has a lot of pass rushing moves. Like he he would throw like four or five different moves in the course of one game. None of them were that great. But the fact that he's throwing, you know, the fact that he's not going to one, you know, tried and true over and over again. That he like he has far more than a guy like Javon Kinlaw does at his disposal already. So at 309 pounds, you're at a 498 at the combine. I did 27 reps. So this guy like there's a lot to like here. Truthfully, he might be a guy who found a board. Like, the more I watch, the more I'm like, he's just got to go up. Because the fact that he's already, like I said, throwing that many moves, that he's capable of them, is interesting. Now, they, they, weren't, they didn't lead to elite production, but they led to pretty good production. And Arkansas, one of the things that is difficult to capture in the grading is opportunity. Mm-hmm. Arkansas was losing a lot of games this past year. He didn't have a lot of opportunity where he was like, I can pin my ears back and rush the passer here in the third, fourth quarter. They were getting, you know, blown. The doors blown off him in a lot of games to where uh, third and fourth quarter, he's 
only running only run stuff and like all he has to do is care about the run so uh, didn't get a chance to necessarily see exactly what he could do as a pass rusher but when you saw at the shrine game it was pretty dominant but the competition at the shrine game did suck so <laughs> you know, it was nowhere near the o-line talent that you saw at you know the uh, senior bowl i want to go back and watch more of this guy's tape because i have a handful of things that i think is going to rise his bo- raise raise his stock after reading into his background a bit former five star that started played a ton as a true freshman. His nickname in high school was Sosa, which I feel like is pretty fire. I do like that as a nickname, yeah, man, and it's and it's up from uh, Chief Keef, isn't and, it? Yeah, and it's a, <laughs> and it's a game. Oh, it is a game. It's yeah. a game. So McTelvin a game. McTelvin Sosa a game. Not a game. Practice. Oh, sorry. Oh, it's <laughs> Alan Iverson. You're terrible. <laughs> I know. That's... All right, all right, oh, all right. Moving forward that. here, let's let's run through these pretty quickly here. These are the, the the names that we do have outside of PFF's top 150, but are in the 2020 NFL Draft Guide. Starting with Robert Windsor of Penn, Penn State. Yeah, and so he's the guy that I would have loved in years past. I'm like, man, this guy. He's got the he's got the ability to rush the passer. Like he has he has some moves. He's got some quickness. Uh, but he's like 285 pounds. And there's no way he holds up against the run in the NFL. Like he's just not going to play anything other than he's a DPR at the NFL level. You are designated pass rusher. Like he's just not going to be on the field anything other than, you know, a third and long. Mm-hmm. And, and he wasn't that, and he's not that good to justify a, a roster spot just for that, you know, maybe a little that he adds as a pass rusher in third and long situations. He, he went to the senior bowl, was not exceptional. Now, he's another guy who has a spin move, but he's not quite a fat boy swim move because at mm-hmm. 285 pounds, it's, it's a normal boy split spin move. You, I expect you to be able to have a spin move at that weight. So uh, there's a little something there to me, and this is cheap. Uh, he, he reminds me a lot of Anthony Zettel coming out of Penn State as well. Like They were similar, undersized pass rushers. Zettel kicked to the edge, was a little productive there, had a little bit of a career in the NFL, and then kind of fizzled out. That might be Windsor's best bet is to lose some weight and play on the edge. Yep. All right, moving forward here, we are going to go to – I want to talk, talk to two Ole Miss guys, the guys who went to the senior bowl that did not They're necessarily not show out. <laughs> I didn't think they were that great either. Josiah Coatney and Benito Jones, the two Ole Miss guys. Josiah Coatney had some reps at Ole Miss that I was like, damn, these are good. Like he had some reps where he gets up field and, and really had showed like a what I thought was a good get off. Uh, he goes to the combine and did not show a good get off anymore. Um Benito, 5.21 40 yard dash, uh, over eight second shuttle, or excuse me, over eight second three count, over eight second shuttle would be uh, you fell and didn't even get back up. Uh, so I, he's just toast. Like that guy, I, I, there's not a lot to like about him. And then yeah. Benito Jones, nose tackle, can, he's a plugger. Like he's, he holds up mm-hmm. well against double teams. Just zero as a pass rusher, like beyond zero. Didn't win. I think he won one rep the whole week in the one on ones at the Senior Bowl. The, the, the reason I grouped these two guys together is because the two Ole Miss guys at the Senior Bowl really, really struggled. They had a rough time. They did not. They did not do well in the one on ones. It was like yeah. an offensive. You know, any offensive lineman was just looking great against these guys. I will mm-hmm. say. Moving to two other guys at the Senior Bowl: Jason Strobridge of UNC and Larry Murchison, two other guys that were, were there at the Senior Bowl. I don't know what to do with Jason Strobridge, the UNC edge D tackle kind exactly. of guy. Yeah. edge D tackle he's 275 pounds but he's like claiming to be a defensive tackle right now and he did not look like he, he has n- he didn't look great against the run when he was you know playing off the edge like I, I just worry about a role for this there guy. were a couple reps at the senior bowl where he looked good but there was also yes. that one where Josh Jones was playing guard and he buried him and into buried the turf him. yeah so like that's what you worry about when a guy is 275 playing on the interior is that he gets absolutely swallowed up, and you have a gaping hole for a running back to run through because this guy just like, can't hold his gap side whatsoever. So, and, and the, another guy to where he's not – the pass rush he's going to add on the interior is not such that I'm going to you know, give him a, a roster spot there because he's just such a liability in the run game. So I, I don't know. I, I, don't, I don't know what to do with him. I like Murchison a lot more, the UNC, uh, NC State defensive tackle. I think he offers a more complete skill set. Uh, on the interior, another guy who kind of played out of position at NC State this past year in terms of he was playing a lot off the edge or outside of kind of like what James Lynch was doing at Baylor, a lot of off the offensive tackles outside shoulder. Um, and he looked a little better at the Senior Bowl in terms of he, he looks more complete. It's still another guy to where there's not any one great thing he can hang his hat on, just kind of a solid all around. Like you draft him in the fifth round, and if he plays 300 snaps for you, you're not going to be too worried about it sort of guy. Okay. That's I mean, that's what we're getting to right now. We're exactly. at the bottom of the barrel here. Yeah. We're at the bottom of the barrel of the draft guide. Uh, four more names to bring up. Let's start with Raquan Williams and Rashard Lawrence. Of, Rashard Lawrence of LSU and Raquan Williams of Michigan State defensive tackle. Yeah, Rashard Lawrence was a guy who people 
as a sophomore back in 2017, he looked like there was something there. Like we were going to see some, uh, you know, he had a pass rushing grade around 70, which, you know, in the SEC as a sophomore, you're kind of like, oh, that's that can improve in, in the upcoming years. Uh, it just never came after that. And I think the thing is he's just not that athletic. Like he has a lot of nice – he has some nice pass rushing moves, and he had some nice reps, you know, out on the edge, even at an LSU scheme where he was beating offensive tackles. And anytime you see, like, a 300-pounder beating offensive tackle, you're like, ooh, what is that? Like, that doesn't happen a lot. He's 34-inch arms, but he had an 8.03 cone. There's just not a lot of – not a lot of juice, not a lot of sort of like shake to his game. He's an he's older prospect just, too, isn't he? I think he's a little bit older. He's straight up – he is a senior, but I'm not sure his age, but he's okay. just not – there's just – the athleticism is not quite there to that is going to get you excited. And th then the production was definitely not quite there. And, and with Raekwon Williams, you, you are not a fan. Oh, Raekwon Williams is just like kind of a statue guy. Yeah, like yeah. He, he's just so – he's – so I talked about how Raekwon Davis – is not to Raekwon Scout here, but Raekwon Davis is your quintessential 3 4 defensive end. Raekwon Williams is like that amplified. Like he has absolutely nothing as a pass, even less, you know, athleticism to rush the passer and, and, and probably a little worse in run defense. So uh, I, can, I can, another guy who you can throw, you can roster him because you won't feel too, he's not going to get your, you know, he's not going to have in run defense, he's not going to jeopardize your gap integrity. Like he'll hold his gap. But he's not necessarily going to be a playmaker, and he's not going to rush the passer for you, unfortunately. All right, jumping to Garrett Marino, the UAB defense tackle. I think he put up, what, 41 reps at his pro day on the bench press? Yeah. This guy's got some some strength to his game. I, and he's also graded very, very well for us. He's also, and this was, I wanted to love him as a prospect coming out of UAB. The grade was great, over 90 this past year. He is 25 years old. Oh, man. Garrett Marino. He, had, he went on an LDS mission, I believe, um, way back when. And so he's the oldest guy. He'll be 26 as a rookie, actually. He's the so Hayden like he's Hurst not of just, this class. Yeah. Not just that he's old. He's, like, absurdly old. Uh, but he had a 90.3 run defense grade, 90.6 pass rushing grade. Is explosive, is strong, but he's not – He, he's, like, 290 pounds. And he's kind of, like – any double team was just toast for him. He was gone. And so, and that's even against college competition. So pure three technique, uh, there was like a, I don't know what to do with it. Cause it, is there, I don't know how the, the learning curve goes for guys who take an LDS mission, like just don't play football for a few years. Does it kind of, does the clock reset? Like, is it just go on pause or is this guy still have, or, or is because he's 26 years old, is this like what he's only going to be? Like, is there still room and, if that, and this here? is what he's only that's going to be tough. playing, you know, UAB with who they played this past year. That's that's a concern. Exactly. That's, I, that's the biggest concern. I mean, day three flyer, though, I'm, I'm more comfortable taking a guy like him than I am. Maybe yes. Raekwon Williams. You yeah, know, I, I, I think could there's something there's guy. something there. There's yeah. something there to build off of. Last guy here. It's the Nebraska defensive tackle. I think Oklahoma State transfer Darian Daniels. He did not get the love. The other Nebraska defensive tackle. I was going to say, we can just throw all these guys. Yeah. Khalil Davis, Carlos Davis, all in it. So I'll start with the backgrounds on Khalil Davis and Carlos Davis, two more Nebraska defensive tackles. These guys come from like a big track background. So I think in high school, it was Carlos Davis that won the shot put and discus in the state championships. Mm -hmm. His brother finished second in both. Like these guys were like legit like track athletes. And it's a big reason why their, their 40s were great because their starts were so smooth. Like the smoothest of any of the defensive linemen that participated at the combine. Both of them clocked pretty good 40-yard dashes. Both of these guys are athletic, but what are they on the football field? So that's the thing. Nebraska's getting this high preseason. It's all built around, oh, they got you know Darian Daniels coming in. They have the Davis brothers. This D-line's going to be, you know, nuts. They all graded like shit in 2018. Like these guys were not like good. They maybe are like they maybe have the NFL athleticism and the NFL bodies you want, but they weren't good productive football players. Darian Daniels is just a uh, chonk there in the middle of Nebraska's defense, six three, around the three thirty range. Uh, it just a, he's a, a uh, phone booth guy, or as we like to say, a uh, porta potty guy. Yeah, uh, like he plays. That's that's where he's going to win. Nothing really outside of that whatsoever. And the Davis brothers, just like, they don't have pass rushing. Guys. I mean, look, Khalil Davis led the Nebraska team with 32 total pressures, which is good, not great. Carlos with 17 total pressures, and Darion Daniels had eight. Yeah. Eight total pressures. So the, not a lot of pass rushing upside the, for any of those guys. They just – and the Davis, the Davis brothers, like, they don't have moves. It's been that way for four years. They get most of their pressures off stunts. It's just – 
what are you gonna do with that? I yeah. mean, like athleticism only gets you it gets you in the door. It doesn't get you on the football field making plays though, unfortunately. That's going to do it for the defensive tackle class overview here on YouTube. If you are listening uh, to the podcast, the audio version, you're going to hear our interviews with Denzel Mims, the Baylor wide receiver, and Hunter Bryant of Washington. Until next time, guys, Austin Gale, Mike Renner, two for one drafts.